So with this era, 1450 to 1750, we've spent a lot of time talking about how empires are going to be expanding, whether they're the land-based empires that we see in the old world, like in Russia, or the Ottoman Empire, um, or they are these new European overseas empires. We're going to see some dramatic changes in the size and the stature of empires, and these new, bigger empires are going to also lead to some new gender uh, relationships and particularly new racial hierarchies uh, within these societies. And so we're going to run through and talk about a number of these changes uh, that will take place during this era uh, with regard to uh, relationships between people. So if you have a question on your AP exam that talks about continuities or changes or comparing and contrasting social issues during this era, this is the one for you, okay, the relationship between people. Uh, first, we're going to go to China, and we might remember um, China is the one society, I think, that doesn't fit very nicely into this period of, of, of um, history that world historians have created, this 1450 to, uh, to 1750 period. Uh, because we've got the, the fall of the, the Mongol Wan dynasty in the end of the 1300s, the rise of the Ming, and the Ming are going to last until the mid-1600s, and then you get a new dynasty, the Qing dynasty, coming in. So, so China doesn't really fit perfectly into this 1450 to 1750 era, uh, but here we're going to talk about uh, the, the rise of Manchu and the, the, what becomes known as the Qing dynasty. Uh, like the Mongols, the Mongols in, in the 1200s are going to be conquering China. Do you remember what, Dainese, what Chinese dynasty the Mongols conquer? Song. The Song dynasty. And then they take a Chinese name, they take a Chinese name, and they become the Yuan dynasty of China. Like that, the Manchu are not Chinese. They're not ethnically Chinese. They're not like the rest of China. They're foreigners. They're outsiders. They are the former northern barbarians that we would have talked about um, in, in earlier times in history. Well, in 1644, those outsiders, those Manchu, are going to conquer and bring an end to the Ming dynasty. And as they rule, now you have another ethnic minority that is ruling a majority Chinese. Now, likewise, they will adopt a, a Chinese name, uh, for, for their dynasty, the Qing dynasty. But it is a dynasty ruled by foreigners, by outsiders. All right? So compare the Manchu rule of the Qing to the Mongol rule of the, of the Yuan dynasty. The Manchu are going to work to keep themselves ethnically, racially separate from the majority Han Chinese. When I say Han, we know Han was a dynasty of China, right? Shang, Zhou, Qin, Han. Han is also the largest ethnic group within China. Han Chinese are the majority ethnic group in China. So the Manchu are going to come in, and when they rule, they want to keep themselves largely separate from the majority population. And they're going to do a few things that will keep themselves uh, separate, or, or at least assert their dominance over the majority Chinese. For example, Manchu, there's a, there's a distinct Manchu language of the Manchu people. And they will make it illegal for ethnic Chinese to learn that language. Chinese will even be forbidden from traveling to Manchuria, traveling to Manchuria in the north, because that's where they could learn that language. Intermarriage between Manchurians and Chinese will be made illegal. And this is kind of different. We've seen other states. Can someone think of a, a state or a, a, a society that encouraged intermarriage in order to strengthen a large empire? You, you could talk about the Roman, the Roman Empire intermarriage with... Okay, I, I think we're going to Alexander the Great there. Uh, think of Alexander the Great conquering Persia, and you're absolutely right. Alexander the Great taking a Persian wife to solidify his rule over this new territory. Absolutely, yes. Uh, the Incas uh, would, would incorporate and, and try to bring in different peoples through marriage. Very good, yes. Uh, we would see that within the Mongol Empire. So, so this, 
this is unique, this, this Manchu trying to stay isolated, not allowing this intermarriage because they wanted to keep a separation between the races. Um, and then you'll also see a lot of preferential treatment of Manchu within the Qing dynasty. This uh, hairstyle that you guys can see where, where the front of the head is kind of shaved while the, the back uh, hair uh, is, is grown quite long. This is kind of like extreme mullet going on, I guess you could say. Um, the, uh, this is known as the Q. The word Q just means like it's a fancy way to say line up, right? If you, if you lived in England, you wouldn't stand in line. You would get in the queue. Um, so it's a long, long line that would be braided, a long, long strip of hair that would be braided. And this was a distinct Manchu style for, for men in Manchuria. And the Manchu would impose this hairstyle upon all the Chinese, even though that was not how the Chinese wore their hair. They would force this upon everybody as a way to, like, assert dominance of their culture over the Chinese. Yes? So why would they make all of the Chinese look like them, but they not want them involved in their culture? Well, it's not that they wouldn't want them. It's, it's that they wouldn't want them to be... Um, seen as equal. It's, it's basically forcing an aspect of their culture onto the Chinese who didn't want it, uh, but they were forced. It, it kind of makes them more subservient. But yeah, they still wouldn't have uh, intermarriage, and there were still areas where ethnic Chinese would be uh, discriminated against. Um, we will see this pop up again. We will see this story pop up again at the end of the next era when the Qing dynasty will come to, to an end, when this begins to be removed from Chinese culture again. Yes? Uh, just to answer someone's question, they mostly did this for, like, they, they, well, it was a theory, but it ended up not working. But they, they, they were uh, adhering to the theory that when you impose your own, your own culture on someone, someone else, they forget, they forget about their own. Mm -hmm. So what, they, what they're trying to do is that the reason why they force men to do this is because men have, have like, you know, they, they, can, they can have an uprising or something like that. They can rebel. So what you do is that you impose this hairstyle on them so they, so they kind of, over time, forget about their own culture, forget about their own identity. And give them less and, will to rise yeah. up. I like they that. I feel like they're, they, they're not, like you said, they're, they feel subservient to the rulers. Cool. I like that. Yeah. Um, there will also be a separate court system, a separate legal system for Manchu within China. So two sets of rules, one for ethnic Chinese and one lighter set of rules for, uh, for Manchu. And then the bureaucracy in China is still going to exist because the bureaucracy in China is always going to exist during these dynasties. The bureaucracy will still be there, but Manchu will be given preferential treatment and more prestigious positions within the bureaucracy. They can't exclusively control the bureaucracy because China is so big and they need um, people that are not Manchurians necessarily to occupy some of those roles within the bureaucracy. But the highest positions, the most elite positions, uh, would be left for the Manchurians. All right? So ethnic separation within China. There we go. Now we move to the Americas. And what you guys see here is a map of, of what we can call New Spain, of all of the, the Spanish territories that will be conquered uh, by the Spanish kingdom, divided into what are known as vice royalties. All right? Like... Vice president is under the president. A vice royal is a, a under the king. All right. So these are the Spanish vice royalties of the Americas, and the Spanish crown would appoint Spaniards to be what we call the viceroy. A uh, viceroy is a is a title. A, a, it's a power title. So the Spanish king would appoint a viceroy of each of these areas to administer in the king's absence, to administer these areas. These vice royalties were controlled by guys that would be known as peninsulares. Peninsulares. Obviously, it, it means it's somebody that comes from the peninsula. What peninsula? Iberian. The Iberian Peninsula. So the Peninsulares in the Americas would be the most dominant ethnic group because those were Spaniards born in Spain, likely given a position by the king to go to this new world and rule and control in his stead. And they're absolutely going to be loyal to the king 
because the king gave them that position. All right? The Peninsulares are going to be at the top of the, the social mountain in uh, South America. Now, when a mom Peninsulare meets a... Well, let's go the other way because we're a patriarchal society. When a dad Peninsulare meets a mom Peninsulare and they start singing sweet music to each other, but they're living maybe in New Spain or New Granada or, or the royalty of Peru, and they start talking sweet nothings in Spanish to each other, and maybe after marriage, nine months later, there's a little baby in a baby carriage born in possibly Mexico City. I don't know. They don't count for those that things. child will not be a peninsulare anymore. Because he was not born in Spain. He will be a Creole. He will be a Creole. A Creole in the Spanish colonies is a white person born within the colonies. So his parents or grandparents are of Spanish descent. But he was born in the colonies. The Spanish colonies, yep. Now, the monarchy and the peninsulares might look down upon this Creole class because they aren't connected to the, the king like they once were. You know, they have more of an, an association. They're going to probably live their entire life in the colony. So the, the old aristocracy, the old peninsulares might look down upon this class but what do you think is going to happen to the Creole class over time compared to the Peninsulares? Yes. Thank you. Yes. It's going to grow because moms and dads are going to have more babies and over time there's going to be more and more children born in the Americas. And eventually the Creole class is going to become much larger than the Peninsulare class. So what do you think happens next? We, this is spoiler alert because it's for our next era. But what do you think is going to happen next? Yeah, eventually there's going to be a move for independence. We do it first. We do it first. But shortly after the United States pushes for independence, Latin American colonies are going to push for their own independence, and that will be dominated by the Creole class, who feel they're, they're not getting a fair shake because the Peninsulares want to keep running the show. All right? So eventually when revolution comes to the Americas in Latin America, it's going to be dominated by this white Born in the Americas Creole class. Yes, ma'am. Because they're not born in Spain. The, the king didn't directly hand them their title. They're, they're not from Spain. Because we humans, we like to find ways to like draw lines between ourselves, don't we? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, there, was, there was another aspect. So the, 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 it's, the, I, I found that this is almost the complete opposite of what, what like in the traditional monarchy is. Because your because your descendants are not more are not you know royal at all. They're, they're just you know normal, they're like they're lower they're a lower class than of the previous previous generation sure. because they're Creoles, right? So does that mean that the, that the Peninsulares are like they're they're not a um, they're not they don't they don't consist of a family line because they are they're uh, repeatedly selected by the king? Yeah, no, I mean the the encomiendas, for example, that the Peninsulares might have been in control of. They will be passed down through families. Uh, but eventually, the peninsulares that were in control of them become Creoles. And this is just in reference, just the same talking about the, the Creole class is going to be growing as the peninsulare class is going to shrink over time. And that, that's where that swap is going to come from. All right, under those guys, we have um, an extremely intricate division of, of racial uh, hierarchy within the Americas. And this is known as the Costas, the Spanish Costas. Kind of looks like what word? Yeah. This is the Spanish-American caste system. All right? And it won't quite be as rigidly viewed as the, as the Indian caste system, but unlike the Indian caste system, it is much more driven by, by race than, uh, than anything else. So here we have, you guys can't, can't read all this, but various divisions of, of the Spanish caste system. We'll just mention a few of the big ones here. We already talked about peninsulares at the top. Those are those whites born in Spain, given title or position in the New World. 
and then the Creoles are their children. Under them, we have a group called the Mestizos, M-E-S-T-I-Z-O-S, -E Mestizos. The Mestizos are Europeans and Native Americans. So when a, maybe a European father meets eyes with a Native American mother, and they have a child who is obviously of mixed race between the two, that would be in the Mestizo class. And in this Spanish Costa system, they are going to be of lower rank in the social hierarchy than the Creoles. All right? A Mestizo might have a Creole dad, could have a Peninsulare dad. But he's going to be lower rank because he's also got Native American uh, with, within his heritage. Under them, yes, ma'am? Yeah, that would be just a Creole. But, again, we have a lot of delineation of what could possibly happen there within the ranks. Um, and we don't need to get too specific. You can't be born as a Peninsulari. That's the point. Yeah, you wouldn't, yeah, a Peninsulari has got to be somebody that was born in, in the Americas. So once you're, once you're here, or one, born in uh, the Iberian. Once you're here, you're going to be a Creole if you're having kids. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you know what, it, it, it likely does, but that goes beyond where we're going to go. You will, if, if you walk out, uh, walk into the AP World exam with an understanding that there are these major divisions, you're, you're good to go. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back. Are there any, like, political, I mean, not political, sorry, religious people that make sense in the world or above other people? Um, you know what, that, that question I don't know. Uh, obviously, the Catholic Church is very important within Spanish America, um, but what are Catholic, Catholic priests not doing? <laughs> They're not supposed to be having kids. Um, so they would kind of be beyond uh, this, this setup. Um, but, gosh, yeah, i got to imagine, like, once they're here, there's going to be Creole trained and ordained as priests. So they would probably be beyond this because they're, they're priests. Uh, yeah, Brandon. How would they differentiate between the Peninsulares and the Creoles by doing the same race? Yeah, good call. How do you know between a Peninsular and a Creole? My guess is the Peninsulares are going to let you know about it. Uh, but uh, it's, they're, they're the ones that are typically going to have the actual king's charter to, to control land and such. Uh, but over, over not a lot of time, the, the Peninsulares are going to cease to be as important. All right. Um, under, under those mestizo populations, we have mulattoes. The mulattoes, M-U-L-A-T-T-O is the Spanish word used for those blending of European and African heritages. So a, a, an African mother and a European father would have a child that would be known in this Costa system as a mulatto. That is a term that is not used anymore. Uh, that is a term that, that was used within uh, certainly American history as well. Uh, but it is certainly not an acceptable or politically correct term um, in modern American society at all. Um, and, but it's also not something, it's not something that is frowned, like, you know, in, in earlier generations, it, it would be absolutely illegal for a white, in, in many communities, even in the United States, uh, for a, a white man or woman to, to marry and have children with a black man or woman. Um, and, uh, and that's something that was, in many cases, illegal across the, the Jim Crow era of American history. You guys learned about this. Um, but in, in the last couple decades, that stigma is, is gone. Um, I remember being a young man walking through the mall, and I, I remember noticing, um, you know, if, if you would see, uh, like, a black man and a white woman, you would be like, oh, that's kind of different. You don't see that a lot. I don't think you guys notice that as anything like different or odd or it's just that's social progress right there. We're kind of getting over some of our racial issues. Um, so anyhow, um, and then, of course, under the mestizo, under the mulatto populations, you just have Native Americans. And then you have Africans. Those Native American populations, they're going to be an exploited population. 
No, Africans under the Native Americans even. Remember, okay, so, so the Native American population, they're initially going to be used as labor. The Native American population are initially going to be used as labor. But what's going to happen a lot of that Native American population? They're going to die, uh, largely due to these, uh, the disease, these old world diseases coming in. And then there's also going to be an outcry from the Catholic priests. Guys like Bartolomeo de las Casas, who say, we need to treat these natives better. And so in a twisted way, how do the Spaniards treat the natives better? By importing Africans to do a lot of the hardest labor. All right? So in, in, a, in a weird, sick way, you treat the Native Americans better by treating Africans more poorly. So in this Costa system, the, the Africans are going to be, the, the slave class is going to be even below Native Americans. But neither of those groups are going to really have any political rights or freedoms or anything like this. Uh, Alex. Um, is, is it also true, like, why, why Africans are, are even lower than Native Americans? Is it because they were imported as slaves? Yeah, they, they, were, they were considered as property. They were, that, this was chattel slavery, considered as property. Hannah. Don't you think that parents were upset that their children were being Yeah, but they still get to live in the big house. So, and they, they're going to be up. Uh, yes, ma'am, Shelby. Okay, well, this, this system wasn't really, like, super rigid because there would be, like, inter- Okay, good, good question. So, obviously, the existence of this system, the, the fact that there are mulattoes and the fact that there are mestizos says that there is certainly some blending of, of the races happening. It wasn't, um, while it might have been frowned upon, it certainly happened. Um, and this might be slightly less of a rigid society. Obviously, there weren't harsh punishments. But it's also a reality of human nature, you know, and people are going to do things, you know, I guess. You know, you got Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. You guys are probably familiar with this story, right? Um, uh, Sally Hemings was a slave of Thomas Jefferson, um, and it is widely believed that the two of them had children with each other. Um, so, um, so it happened. Um, not necessarily sanctioned, but, but it happened because people going to do what people are going to do. Yes? The Native Americans never ended up being actual, like, slaves, uh, but they were kind of tied to their land. They, they were never outright owned by the Spaniards, but they were certainly controlled by the Spaniards. The Africans coming in are seen akin to owning a horse. Uh, so, so there is a different level there. Okay, one more question, and we're going to move on. Um, so I was wondering, well, how come someone, someone like Bartolome de Casas didn't do something for the Africans? De, De Las Casas was like predating the importation of slaves. He was like very early on, um, and it was a lot of his writing and outcry that encouraged the importation of slaves to do the labor. Um, why aren't there Why aren't there later uh, priests that are arguing against the institution of slavery? There will be, there will be, but there's just so much money in the slave trade, um, and that that ultimately dominates. Um, so there's sometimes like pro- property like over I, I, I guess, I guess. Okay, now let's run over to Russia. In Russia, in Russia, there is a traditional landed aristocracy in Russia, and this is like very early Russia, like right as the Mongols are starting to be pushed away. Aristocrats that control the land in Russia known as boyars, B-O-Y-A-R-S. The Russian boyars are the Russian aristocrats. And remember, guys, for most of human history, what is wealth associated with? Land. Land produces wealth because land is where you grow stuff. And then that's the stuff you sell. So if you control land, you are the wealthy. So if you are one of this, this, this group of boyars in Russia, the landed aristocracy, you control the wealth of the Russian state. And you also control the political issues within your region, within the land that you control. Well, as we get a rise of the czars in Russia, starting with Ivan III and later Ivan IV. We talked about Ivan IV was Ivan the Terrible, right? 
As we get the growth of the czars, we have this issue in Russia between a strong central government controlled by the czar and these landed aristocrats, the boyars, around him. The aristocrats want to hold on to power. The czar wants power. But there's only so much power to go around. So within Russia, as the czars will grow in strength, they will begin to try to centralize their control. We've used these words before, right? And how do you centralize your control if you're a king? You smash the aristocrats. You try to weaken them. We saw this in China, right? This is what Qin Shi Huangdi wanted to do. So under Ivan III, but even more so under Ivan IV, the czars will feel threatened by the boyars, so they'll want to weaken the boyars. Ivan III will move to, to deport a number of boyars and centralize them, bring them together, and ultimately, in many cases, execute them. Just get rid of them outright. And then replace the boyars with people that he chooses. We can call these guys like a, a new bureaucracy in, in Russia. And if the king is choosing you, if the czar is choosing you to be in charge, now you owe your loyalty to him. Ivan the Fourth, Ivan the Terrible, will continue this. And will continue the, the deportation of boyars in order to uh, choose people uh, appointed by the czar to rule. Later czars, like Peter the Great in the 1600s or early 1700s, later czars will go even further um, and impose higher taxes and duties on boyars. And if you notice these boyars, now this is early under the Ivans. Notice they've got their long beards, right? Remember what we said about Peter the Great and what he thought of the beards? Get rid of those, because Peter the Great wanted to be more like what? Western. Western Europe, where they weren't sporting beards. They just had cool Captain Hook mustaches, right? So get rid of the beards. And so Ivan, or pardon me, Peter, would target the boyars who were very traditional. Now, why are the boyars very traditional? Because it's the tradition that gave them their power. So Peter would target these boyars with a beard tax. If you want to wear your beard, because you want to be all traditional and boyar, now you've got to pay a, a beard tax to the state. Just more attempts at, at the king trying to assert authority over the aristocrats. Good? In Western Europe, we know that there has long been an aristocratic noble class in Western Europe. For Western Europe, we're going to use the words nobles. Now, you can use the word noble for any of these aristocratic classes, but for Western Europe, it's important to use it. For, for Russia, use boyar if you can. In Western Europe, there's a noble class of aristocrats who had long held large estates. Remember, wealth is derived from the land. And so landed aristocrats, those that owned the land, created the wealth. This goes back to the medieval European age of feudalism. Remember we talked about this. Where a feudal lord, he's a noble, would control his, his fiefdom, his land. And he would have peasant serfs work his land. And he would be able to organize militaries out of that, right? If you ever needed to defend your land or if maybe a central king needed defense against an intruder, he would have to organize his lords who could help organize an army. And so this was important in medieval Europe. But we can see why this is problematic for a king. He needs these lords, he needs these aristocrats, because they can organize a military force for him. If France is going to invade England, the English king better have the lords on his side. But the problem is, the more powerful these lords are, ultimately the weaker the central king is. And this is what we had to wrestle with in medieval Europe. In fact, the lords got so powerful in England, what did they do? Magna Carta. They forced the Magna Carta in 1215 upon the king, giving the, the, the lords more rights and more power within, uh, within the government. And remember as well, England is, is the first European state to develop a parliament, right? And where, where people outside of the king will get to have a voice in their rule. 
And you guys remember the English parliamentary system? There's, there's two houses. Yeah, Commons and Lords. House of Commons and House of Lords. Well, the House of Lords is the upper house, and it was long the most powerful of those houses, made up of representatives of the aristocratic class. But this era is going to change everything. This era brings dramatic changes to those kings and those lords of Europe, those nobles of Europe. Their relationship is going to change, because in this era, wealth is not solely derived from land anymore, in the way it traditionally was. For example, if you're the king of Spain, your wealth was originally derived from the land on the Iberian Peninsula. But after 1492, where will wealth be derived from? Not for Spain. Your colonies, right? Because what do you have in your Spanish colonies? Silver. Silver, right? The mines of Potosi. And who owns that land? Spaniards. Spani it's the Spanish king. It's, it's not these landed aristocrats that you have to work with. It's all king's land. And the king decides what's going to be done with it. So when he finds a mine in Spain, it gives him new wealth that he does not have to go asking the aristocrats for. And so now what can a Spanish king do or a Portuguese king do that they couldn't do before very easily? Remember before, if you had a threat, if you had a military threat, you had to call on your nobles to organize an army for you. Well, now what can the Spanish king do? Just buy his own. He can buy his own army. He can build his own army. He's not reliant on those aristocrats anymore. So this is going to assert the rule of the king. And this is where we get the rise in what we call in Europe absolute rule or absolute monarchs. They don't have to answer to the nobles anymore. This is big. They don't have to answer to the nobles. Why? Because they can afford their own military now. And they can put the nobles in their place. We see this in Spain. We're going to see this in France as well. In France, which will also be getting new wealth from its American colonies. In France, the king, a guy like Louis XIV, for example, can begin to assert his own authority over his nobles in France. This can be done in different ways. Well, one, he can now afford to build his own professional army. That's big. But the king in France will start to sell titles of nobility. You want to be a noble in France? You used to have to be part of a long landed family that had long controlled the territory. But now the king of, of France, he'll sell the positions. If you've got a lot of money, maybe you've raised money because of overseas expeditions and your merchant activity. Maybe you were a part of this new urban elite that's growing in the Middle Ages. Maybe you got into like some kind of new industry or craftsmanship or banking. You could buy a title. Right? Now, of course, what do you think the old landed families are going to think of this new money, these new titled aristocrats? Not going to think very highly of them. But the king doesn't care because these new aristocrats... They're going to be loyal to the king, right? Because he gave them that title, or at least sold it to them. This is the palace of Louis XIV. Louis XIV is uh, the uh, king of, of France in the 1600s. This is the palace of Louis XIV in the early 1700s. Louis XIV builds a palace at a town called Versailles. It's about 20 miles outside of Paris. Has anybody ever been to the palace of Versailles? Anybody been to France? You've been there? You've been to so many wonderful places. Wow, I am jealous along with the rest of your classmates. Ho Chi, uh, Ho Chi Minh was there, yes. But, he, but he, was, he was denied. He did not get what he wanted at Versailles. Anyway, the Palace of Versailles was built by Louis XIV for two big reasons. One, to get the king the heck out of Paris. Because Paris was a dangerous place to be a king. A lot of crazy stuff could happen in Paris. So get out of Paris. Remove yourself from the squabble of the big city. The second reason the Palace of Versailles was built, and if you guys look at the Palace of Versailles, and this is only one view, we'll look at some more pictures in a few minutes, it's pretty big. This would be a big house for a king. This was not meant to be just Louis XIV's house. All right? This was a home for all aristocrats. The aristocrats of France, who are not needed anymore to stay on their land, to control their land directly, because they don't have to worry about outside invasions or organizing militaries, because now under the Louis XIV, who is organizing the military in France? The king is. 
with the king's wealth. So now the aristocrats can go to, go to Versailles and party all day, all night. They can live the life of the aristocracy under the watchful eye of the king. So they can't conspire with each other to overthrow him. The king can keep an eye on him, and they can party. They can dress fancy. Old, remember, old lords, these used to be like leaders, military leaders in many, many cases. The new lords of aristocratic France, these guys are wearing tights and high heels and fancy, fancy shoes and big powdered wigs, and, and, and they can dance the night away. Woohoo! The growth also in Europe of a new middle class that never previously existed. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the czars wanted to smash the aristocrats. In Western Europe, um, just handled it a little bit differently. In, in Russia, the czars moved to smash the aristocrats. In a place like France, for example, Louis started creating more aristocrats by selling titles to raise money, but also created his palace at Versailles to organize, to just keep a better eye on the aristocrats. Didn't take away their title at all, but ultimately took away their power, uh, took away their authority as he brought them to Versailles so he could keep an eye on them. But there wasn't like these mass executions going on like we saw in Russia. It's a perfect example of bread, of, uh, bread and services. Sure. Bread and circus is the phrase used for like the old Roman Empire where um, if the people were suffering, oh, that really stinks. Let's build a coliseum and put tremendous events on so they can watch and go crazy and forget about their horrible existence. And they can yay to the emperor for building this cool thing for us. Yeah, All right. that's basically what he's doing, right? Yeah, pretty much like that. I, I like that comparison. Also in Europe during this age, we have the rise of a new middle class. Remember we talked about in Northern Europe, the Hanseatic League, that was based on trade and created a lot of wealth. You have a new banking industry in Europe developing. You have craftsmen who start to become quite wealthy in Europe. So you have a bunch of new people whose wealth are, are not associated with land ownership. And what can a government, what can a king do to those people? Tax them. A king can start raising money from these people. It's going to further separate the king from needing those aristocrats anymore. And it creates a stronger king monarch class. Good? Good. Yes? Wait, so he, he, the, middle, the middle class goal bro, grows because of what? Um, the rise of craftsmen guilds and the rise of the banking industry and the rise of merchant activity and trading activity that's going to make a lot of new people who were never before associated with like the landed aristocracy when I say landed aristocracy those are the aristocrats that own land new people are going to have wealth that didn't have wealth before so maybe in France they could buy a title they could buy a noble title or maybe in northern Europe they can um, they can just pay taxes to a king and help the king raise money so he can create his own professional army and not need those aristocrats anymore. Yeah. Final thing to talk about in this standard is just the change in European families. Family structures are going to change and it's going to start in this era. Do you guys remember when we talked about the Neolithic Revolution back 3000 BC, 5000 BC, earlier than that in some places? Remember this? When, family, when, when human society were hunter-gatherers, we tended to have smaller families. When we became agricultural workers, we grew our families. Because children now could be used as what? Labor. As labor. This is going to start changing. And it starts with Europe as Europe starts to industrialize. A little bit earlier than many other parts of the world. We're going to see the size of the families, especially in urban centers, start to shrink again. Because in cities, or when your life is not centered on farming, it takes longer for kids to actually be a net benefit for your family. And all of your families and your parents can attest to this right now. Kids are very expensive in our non-agricultural society, right? You guys can't really do any meaningful work to bring in wealth to the family. You can help like around the house. You can help around the house. But you're not bringing in any wealth to the family. You're costing us a lot of money. And that's why the modern family, the modern family has to think a lot about how many kids they want to have. 
because the more kids you might have, the harder it might be to afford the vacations you might want or the education that you might want, right? And so as we start to see this change in Europe from the 1600s into the 1700s, shh, you guys quiet please, I know this is very exciting. As we start to see this change, we see large agricultural families start to slowly be replaced by smaller urban families. And this brings a lot of changes in how the families are structured. We have the growth of now what we call a nuclear family, where there's a mom and a dad and two or three kids, and they just live together, rather than maybe the extended families we saw in medieval Europe, where cousins and everybody might be living together on one plot to help each other out. So it's the rise, the birth of the nuclear family. Le the families are going to be t less tied, and the family wealth is less tied to land ownership. And we're also going to see something new pop up again that we hadn't seen for, for millennia. Those are like thousands of years since like the, the hunter-gatherer days. We're going to start loving our kids again. Yay, like, oh, look, because when you have 15 kids, you, you not included, and you got to spread your love on a lot of people, right? And your kids, remember in agricultural society, your kids are being born to be your laborers ultimately, right? And also, what happens when you have a lot of children in these early agricultural societies? You're going to be losing a lot of them. You're gonna, the kids are not going to make it. Some, some kids aren't going to make it. So it wouldn't be uncommon for a, a mother to have ten children, but to have lost three or four of them, all right? Well, as families grow smaller, as families grow smaller, we're also going to see mortality rates of children drop a little bit, and connections between the parents and their smaller families grow stronger. So families become, especially in Europe, more emotionally bound to each other right, as they grow smaller. We will see this trend continue in the, in the next era that we'll talk about, all the way up to today, when we have totally gone, well, I guess I can't say it. We have, we've pushed this to the nth degree, especially in the Western world, where now the modern American woman is not even replacing herself, all right? Modern American families are having less than two children uh, per their family, which is not replacing populations. Uh, you have to have like 2.1 kids per woman to have your population sustain itself. Um, if, if you have less than that, your population will be in decline over time. That's what most of the modern industrialized world is now going through. Population declines over, over the next few generations. Yes? Like, and also like